America. It's the world's most powerful country, boasting the largest economy, the most powerful and well-equipped army, and a currency that is used for trade all over the world. It looks unstoppable. Few can even imagine a world where the U.S. is not the dominant player. But what if I told you that all of this is about to change? What if I told you that, from the perspective of any business, the U.S. government is already effectively bankrupt? And that over the next decade or even less, the U.S. will likely hit a gigantic financial wall unlike any it has seen before. To pull itself up out of this crisis, America will face a stark choice. Give up its global military supremacy or give up its social programs. And it's all because of a problem that the world's financial experts thought they had fixed, but now has come back. Inflation. Over the past 20 years, the U.S. has borrowed more and more money. It's around 100% the highest since World War II. So what exactly would happen if the U.S. government fails to raise the debt ceiling? We still have a lot of work to do, but we're building a different economy than before. That would totally upend our whole constitutional order. That's not realistic. We have to pay the bills. It would surely be catastrophic. And this is the progress we need to see. The president could change statutory language all on his own. It's really a gimmick and what's necessary is for Congress to show on America paying its debts. This is a silly solution to a silly problem. We Democrats supported of uh, uh, lifting the debt ceiling. One more time, not to play Russian roulette with the American economy. Congress is going Consumer prices are rising at their fastest pace in 40 years these days. And while people certainly understand what that means for their personal finances, many don't realize just how serious a crisis the U.S. government could face if inflation stays at these levels for even just a few years. Phoenix, Atlanta, and Tampa are among the metro region seeing both hot inflation and the pandemic surge of home buying. Over the last 14 years or so, ever since the financial crisis, the U.S. government has run up an incredible public debt. The total amount U.S. taxpayers owe on behalf of their government shot up from around $9 trillion just before the financial crisis to around $31 trillion today including all the deficit spending during the COVID pandemic. This crisis can't really be blamed on one political party or the other. Both Republican and Democratic administrations have pushed the deficit to new heights. President Joe Biden's ironically named Inflation Reduction Act is just the latest addition to the debt burden. President Donald Trump's 2017 tax cuts, not paid for by any spending cuts, were another major contributor to today's debt. We did a rush job today. It's not fancy, but it's the Oval Office. It's the great Oval Office. All of this spending and tax cutting was affordable so long as one condition was in place. Low inflation. When inflation is low, so are the interest rates on your debt. And that's as true for the government as for anyone else. But once inflation picks up steam, borrowing rates go up, and then an excessive debt burden can become a problem. Today in America, inflation has pushed government borrowing costs way up. Amid the COVID pandemic and lockdowns, the U.S. government was borrowing for the short term at less than 0.5%. Today, it has to pay around 4%. That's an eight-fold increase in borrowing costs in just two years. This year, the U.S. government is on track to spend $100 billion more on interest payments than it did last year, and that number will keep rising. If all the debt the U.S. federal government is carrying today were to be borrowed at today's interest rates, the interest payments alone would be $1.4 trillion per year. reported today that the deficit in fiscal year 2022 fell by $1.4 trillion. That's the biggest drop in history. Nearly double the entire U.S. defense budget. 
At those levels, the government would have to borrow new money to pay the interest on previously borrowed money. When businesses find themselves doing that, it's called insolvency, and it's game over. But for a government, it means having to pay even higher interest rates to find lenders to cover their debts. Every year, the U.S. Treasury Department puts out a report on the state of the federal government's finances. It assesses the government's finances the same way a business would assess its finances. In its most recent report, it found the U.S. government has assets of $6 trillion and liabilities of $33 trillion. In a business, assets minus liabilities give you the value that shareholders own. In the case of the U.S. government, its owners, that is, U.S. citizens, are $27 trillion in the whole. Year after year, the Treasury Department report has warned that the U.S. government's finances are unsustainable and headed for trouble. Year after year, politicians of all stripes and the media have ignored it. Soon, it will be impossible to ignore. It's hard to overstate how dangerous inflation can be. Just listen to how Charlie Munger, longtime business partner of billionaire investor Warren Buffett, talks about inflation. Inflation is a very serious subject. You can argue it's the way democracies die. When democracy dies in Latin America, inflation is a big part of it. So it's a huge danger once you've got a populace that learns it can vote itself money. If you overdo it too much, you ruin your, your civilization a lot. And so, of course, it's a big, long-range danger. If you look at the Roman Republic, and even after they went to an empire with an absolute ruler, they inflated the currency steadily for hundreds of years, and eventually the whole damn Roman Empire collapsed. So it's the biggest long-range danger we have, probably, apart from nuclear war. To understand why inflation is an existential risk to America and the whole global economy, we need to look back in time to see how we got here. For the past century, ever since World War I, the U.S. dollar has been the global reserve currency. This means the dollar is sort of the default currency of the world. Much of the international trade that takes place is priced in dollars. That gives the U.S. a great deal of power. Its currency is in demand around the world in ways that other currencies aren't. There is underlying demand for the dollar that has nothing to do with whether or not people want to buy American goods. For decades, under the Bretton Woods system established in World War II, the U.S. dollar was pegged to gold at a value of $35 an ounce. Officially, one U.S. dollar could be redeemed for one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold. But in the 1960s, the U.S. started deficit spending like crazy. First on the Vietnam War, then on top of that, on President Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, a series of new social welfare programs. Many begin to wonder whether the U.S. Federal Reserve actually had the gold to back up all the money it had created. In the summer of 1971, the French government made a request to convert a massive amount of its U.S. dollar holdings to gold. French President Georges Pompidou sent a warship to New York to collect France's mountain of gold. The U.S. government panicked. On August 15th, as the ship headed for New York, President Richard Nixon addressed the nation and declared that he was taking the U.S. dollar off the gold standard. U.S. dollars would no longer be redeemable for gold. The good old greenback would now be a fiat currency. It would be backed by nothing more than the word of the U.S. government. But Nixon understood that taking the U.S. dollar off the gold standard put the dollar's status as the global reserve currency at risk. So Nixon's Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, came up with a plan. He convinced the government of Saudi Arabia to only sell its oil for U.S. dollars. In exchange for this, the U.S. would sell Saudi Arabia weapons. Since Saudi Arabia was at that time far and away the world's largest oil producer, this in effect meant that the global oil industry would be carried out in dollars. Thus, the U.S. dollar survived as the global reserve currency. But the problems with this new system began to appear almost instantly. Right away, the Western world, including the U.S., began to experience inflation. It picked up steam almost as soon as Nixon announced the end of the gold standard and then got worse during the oil crisis of 1973. Inflation robs every American, every one of you. Except for the two world wars, the 1970s and 1980s were the worst period of inflation the U.S. had ever seen. 
With nothing holding up the US dollar except the word of the government, the dollar began to fall sharply against gold and against other commodities. By 1981, 10 years after Nixon removed the gold standard, it took $630 to buy one ounce of gold. The US dollar had lost nearly 95% of its value against gold in a decade. Meanwhile, central banks were fighting inflation by raising interest rates through the roof, causing severe recessions in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and early 1990s. Households found themselves in turmoil as wave after wave of layoffs hit the economy. Wage growth stagnated and never returned to the levels seen earlier. It took two decades of economic pain to bring inflation under control. Meanwhile, the rise of fiat currencies and the ability of central banks to print as much money as they want led to the highest debt levels humanity has ever seen and helped create numerous wealth-destroying asset bubbles like the dot-com bust of the late 1990s, the housing bust of 2008, and now the carnage in cryptocurrencies. Over the past 50 years, the total amount of debt in the world, including government, business, and household debt, went from around 100% of world GDP to 250% of GDP. The world is two and a half times as indebted as it was back then. The more debt you carry, the more vulnerable you are to an economic downturn. You can just think about your own household finances to see how that would be true. So it makes sense that the more debt the world has, the more economic crises it will see. But of course, debt works differently for governments than it does for people and businesses. For one thing, governments can set their own level of income by raising or lowering taxes. And equally importantly, if a government issues its own currency, it can always print more to cover its debts. Technically, such a government can never go bankrupt. But there is a price to be paid for printing money to cover your debts, and that price is inflation. When you print money to cover your debts, you increase the money in circulation without increasing the goods and services available to buy with that money. This creates a perpetual inflation spiral. The more inflation happens, the more governments print to avoid the damage of inflation, causing more inflation. We saw this famously in Weimar Germany in the 1920s. in Argentina repeatedly over the past 60 years or so, and in Eastern Europe during communist times. And now, the U.S. is risking going down that path. Amid the COVID pandemic, the U.S. Federal Reserve balance sheet, the amount of money the U.S. Central Bank has on its books, more than doubled in size, from around $4 trillion to around $9 trillion. All that new money triggered the largest bout of inflation the world has seen since the 70s and 80s. During the COVID crisis, the Federal Reserve monetized the U.S.'s deficit spending. In other words, it bought government debt out of the bond markets, replacing it with fresh new money that could be used to buy more government bonds. By doing this, the Fed kept the government's interest rates artificially low. But now the Fed is fighting inflation, which means it's raising interest rates and reducing its balance sheet. This means it won't be monetizing the U.S. government's debt anymore. It won't be buying that debt out of the markets to help keep interest rates on it low. And if history is any guide, those higher interest rates will tip the world into recession. And when that recession comes, the government will want to ramp up the stimulus spending as always. But this time, in an age of high inflation, the government will discover that borrowing more will mean even higher interest rates on its debt the Fed won't be buying that debt to keep interest rates low. It's hard to overstate how much this will change things politically. If the U.S.'s borrowing costs keep rising, there will be no more generous tax cuts, no more multi-trillion dollar stimulus spending packages. In fact, the U.S. will be looking at tax hikes and spending cuts, something U.S. politicians haven't had to deal with in ages. And it's something U.S. citizens haven't seen from their governments in a long time. It could come as a major shock. At a certain point, the government will be forced to cut spending or raise taxes. It won't have the option of not making its debt payments. So cuts to defense or social spending will be the only options. America will be faced with a choice. Risk your military dominance to an up-and-coming China or let your poor and elderly starve. There will be no way around the plan, not at these debt levels. Meanwhile, governments around the world are losing confidence in the U.S. dollar as the country's debt grows. 
Chinese President Xi Jinping is talking with other countries such as Russia about replacing the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. And maybe most importantly, Saudi Arabia is increasingly signing oil deals in currencies other than the U.S. dollar. This means that in the coming years, the demand for the U.S. dollar could drop. If that were to happen, the dollar would fall against other currencies, making imports more expensive. Americans would lose a lot of their buying power on the global markets. All of which means that a lot of things Americans have taken for granted, from generous government bailouts during economic crises to military bases around the world, Medicaid and Medicare. But you can still protect yourself. Make sure you are prepared for what's ahead. Pay down your debts as much as possible. Diversify your investments and make sure you hold precious metals like gold. Most of all, be prepared for an era of uncertainty when the things you took for granted can no longer be taken for granted. <laughs>